The Immigrant Protection Project of Western Massachusetts recently helped to get several Central American transgender asylum seekers out of detention in New Mexico. How did these women so far away from the region come to the attention of lawyers here? That's among the questions I asked Megan Clute, a local attorney who volunteers on the project. Basically, these are contacts I'd had previously. So I have done some work on the border before. I was down in Artesia, New Mexico, when there was the original surge in 2014 of uh, mothers coming in with children, and the government under Obama was detaining them. So I went down to Artesia, New Mexico, where they were holding them in a federal law enforcement training facility. And it was pretty insane. It's almost like everyone who was down there sort of knows each other and are war veterans. It was very, very intense. It becomes a really small circle, I'd imagine. Yeah, because, you know, originally they wouldn't even let lawyers in, so it became very intense, you know, in, during those early days. So there were about hundreds of people, mothers and little kids detained in this facility and very small numbers of lawyers that were actually able to go in. So, it, you know, it was di very difficult for lawyers to find time with you know, it's pro bono, so... Right, we, the Immigrant Protection Project, you're a full-time attorney here right, in the region, exactly, but exactly. your work on this project is completely right. voluntary, and, right? And, and this was actually a different project. This was the uh, American Immigration Lawyers Association project down there. So there were, basically how it went is we had small groups of attorneys at a time trying to represent hundreds of people. And after a month or so, we found that there were more attorneys who had been down there than attorneys that could be down there at a time. So we started developing remote networks of attorneys attorneys that could do work for the attorneys on the ground uh, remotely. So we had people all over the country that would be preparing all of the paperwork to help with the case, and we developed all of these systems. So an attorney on the ground in the facility could get a client's information, send it to somebody remotely, and remote teams around the country could work with the sponsors that they were potentially going to go with, get documentation, prepare the whole case, and then send it back down to the people on the ground. Which is how something that's happening in New Mexico now exactly. is connected here to Western Mass. Exactly. So I had that background. I had been doing it for Artesia and then another facility opened in Dilly in 2015. I went down there. And so we had this going for a few years. And so with IPP, IPP has been focused on doing bond and getting people out of detention in this area. But we found that we had a lot more volunteers and attorneys than we had need for it because it seems ICE is not really striking as hard in this area as we thought that they would be. So we said, well, look, we're here. We need to stay relevant. We need to uh, be able to pivot. And so I said, well, the, the border is where the help is really needed. And we, I already know how to do this. We already have systems in place from before, from this other work. So I got in touch with the people I knew who, who I worked with before and who are trying to create systems around the country for this now. And so they said, OK, great. We will hook you guys up with this group in, our, in uh, New Mexico. So it's the, the New Mexico Dreamers Project, mm -hmm. which was, is being run by another person who I volunteered with, actually, my first week in 2014. So she was also there, and she has created this, this uh, pro bono project down there. So they were working specifically with people, everyone in that detention facility, but there was a special trans woman pod, and they were really trying to help them because the abuses going on there were just horrific, and people were in solitary confinement and not getting medication they need, and it was just uh, really dramatic. So we said, well, that's a great scheme for us because they all have similar cases. We can work on them as a group. Yeah, because transgender women and people in general have been particularly persecuted, according to Amnesty International. Right. Um, it called them some of the most vulnerable refugees in the Americas. Mm -hmm. And um, Erica Guevara Rosas of Amnesty International said, quote, the fact that Mexico and the U.S. are willing to watch on as they suffer extreme violence, meaning these transgender women, mm -hmm. is simply criminal. Is that what you've seen, too? Absolutely. These, these stories are absolutely horrific. For every one of the women that we got, we, we got the full report of what happened when they were screened. They, when they came in, the reason they were not deported is they were initially screened by an asylum officer who determined that they, they did seem to have a claim for asylum and allowed them to stay in the country to have a full hearing before an immigration judge. So in that interview, we have the transcripts of all the things that came out in these interviews and a lot of just terrible things, lots of stories of sexual abuse, and rape and violence and being forced to do sex work and, and a lot of things like that is just awful. The, the level of trauma that these women are, are going through is, is terrible. And now they're, they're going through some of that with ICE. We've heard about abuses in the facilities there and, and it's really just reactivating all those traumas. So it's been our first priority to try and get them out.
And so right now, 14, you've been successful in securing 14 of the 20 you would hope to, but there were six that were still being detained there in New Mexico. Do you know the status of those six transgender women? Yeah, so with the with the 20, what we were doing, and they're, they're all going to sponsors around the country. So there are multiple you know, different nonprofits working together. There's the nonprofit on the ground, there's us, and there's another one that's working to secure sponsors for these people around the country. So there were 20 different sponsors who all agreed to do it in all different states, and ICE got all of our requests, and there was actually a, a lawsuit that happened around the same time, um, Damis, that was in that, in that district that said that they, ICE cannot just keep holding people without reviewing their cases for parole. So this all happened, and they said, okay, Finally, they looked at all the requests, and six of the sponsors they didn't like. Uh, they, they said that there was some issue, either they didn't seem to have enough uh, financial resources to really be a sponsor, or perhaps they had a criminal record and, and ICE didn't feel comfortable releasing them into the home of somebody with a criminal record. And a sponsor essentially is another adult that opens their home and, and provides food and a place to sleep basically, right? That's right. And the sponsor doesn't actually sign any paperwork. There's no formal sponsor role under immigration law. It's just that's what convinces ICE to let them go is somebody saying, I will take this person into my house. I'll find them an immigration lawyer. I'll get them to their hearings. They won't run away. I'll give them food, shelter, access to to mental health um, resources but for these sponsors they didn't like them so what we did right away is that organization tried to find new sponsors for them so three of them they were able to find new sponsors very quickly we filed new parole requests last week and three of them are being released today we heard last night so it's very exciting for us and then uh, fourth one we submitted this week and the last two we didn't get sponsors for again until a couple of days ago. So we're working hard on getting those filed. So hopefully, you know, by the time this airs, maybe they'll all be released. And there are more. So we're actually working on two more now. And it's, it's just a grueling process because we find the women. The women come into the facility, and then this other organization has to find them a sponsor, which is a huge responsibility for a sponsor. It's, it's not easy to do. And then it comes back to them and circles back to us. So it's everybody working together to, to make to this make happen. Sure this gets done. Mm -hmm. So I imagine there are people watching this who are thinking, you know, there's a path towards citizenship, and mm -hmm. yet these people are skipping the line, they're coming to the border and saying, let me in. Mm -hmm. People find fault with that. What would you say? Well, they're actually following the law because everyone, every one of them, these, these women in particular, came to the border as refugees seeking asylum. They did what they were supposed to do under the U.S. asylum law. They came in, they immediately surrendered themselves and say, I am seeking asylum based on what's happened to me, persecution in my country. And they do meet the definition of asylees and refugees because they, they have a protected ground of their transgender status, and that is the reason why they're being persecuted horrifically in their country. So they went through the process. They had the, they call, we call them credible fear interviews, which is when the asylum officer screens them. They said, yes, it really does look like this person might have a, a very good case for asylum before the immigration judge. And then they're allowed to stay and wait until they actually have a chance to be heard by a judge. So there, there's different areas of immigration law, but under asylum law, this is absolutely legal. And this is, and this is under international law as well. We're expected to protect refugees that arrive on our border in this way. For you, like we said, you're a very full-time attorney <laughs> in the region. Why volunteer and do this additional work? Oh, well, I feel like at this time everybody needs to be doing something, and it's it's not always enough to, to do the work that we do at the office and then go home and not feel like we're participating. And there's so much that needs to be done. There's so much need. There, there are so many things happening that I feel like everybody needs to do a little bit extra and take a little bit of that extra time in whatever way they can and whatever skills they have. And I don't have a lot of other skills so these are the skills I bring to the table and we have all these attorneys who are able to do this work but wouldn't be able to do it if I couldn't be there to link them first to supervise it and explain some of the immigration law concepts and then to link them to the people on the border that actually need it so I feel like if I if I wasn't able to do that we would also lose the ability of a lot of these volunteers who are looking for ways to plug in sure. so it's it's sort of a hub and spoke kind of thing and sometimes, I, you know, I, a lot of the work, I'm not drafting most of these because we have, a, that I wouldn't be able to do, but we have a network of all of these volunteers. And IPP has a, a coordinator, uh, Javier Luengo, and he's been absolutely fantastic. He's been 
helping collect all the documents, calling sponsors. Um, and some of the volunteers have been extremely active in doing that and developing resources and, and uh, looking up information about what's happening to these people in their countries and help bolster these parole requests. So that a lot of that has not been me. It's been them doing all that work and then me just looking at it and making sure it looks good and then coordinating with the people on the ground so it's not chaos.